So there are three major characteristics of any distribution of scores or data. Shape, central tendency, and variability. Now we've talked a lot about shape and we've talked about central tendency, but now we're going to move on to variability. Also I want to note that now we're mostly going to be working with interval and ratio data which form a normal distribution and the mean is going to be the measure of central tendency that we're concerned with. So in chapter two we learned how to present quantitative data in a manageable form so we used frequency distributions in graphs to present that data and determine the frequency of each data point. So we could look at you know opinions rated on a survey or levels of pain or test scores or number of semesters at an SC whatever we want to look at and we could turn that table of frequencies and values for whatever we're measuring into a graph that would help us easily view what the shape of the distribution is be it positive skew, negative skew, normal distribution, bimodal, all sorts of different distributions. So that's all about shape. And then chapter three was all about central tendency. So that's how we find a simple quantitative description of data that tells us the center of the distribution or that represents the trend in the data. So that was all about the mean, the median, and the mode. And remember, which one you use depends on the scale of measurement and the shape or skew of the data. Well, now we're moving on to variability. And variability is just a fancy word for the spread of scores or the dispersion of scores or the differences among scores. So as you'll see, first we'll look at picturing the variability, just showing you what the spread looks like in different types of data sets. Then I'm going to talk about the range. There is two different formulas, one if you have discrete variables and another if you have continuous. Then the standard deviation. And there again, there's two different formulas, one if you're using a sample and the other for a population, and then the variance, two different formulas, one for the sample, one for the population. And you'll see this here in a little bit, but the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Those two measures are very closely related. And then finally, I'll show you the empirical rule, which is basically just outlining the proportions that are predictable in a normal distribution based on the mean and the standard deviation. So here's an example of a distribution that has no variability whatsoever. So if I took a sample of, let's say I took a convenient sample of my students in Psych 210, and I said, how many arms do you have? pretty high likelihood that everybody would say two. So in a situation where there's no variability, all the scores are the same. So if you calculated any of the measures of variability, it would be zero. Here's another example. Instead of having no variability, now we just have very little variability. There's not a whole lot of spread in scores. Here the mean uh, age of children in a kindergarten class is five. There's a couple four-year-olds and some six-year-olds, but for the most part, it's all clustered around that mean age of five. So we wouldn't have zero for a measure of variability, but it would be a relatively small number compared to the measures of variability in a distribution that looks more like this. So instead of looking at you know age among number or age among kindergarten students, if we looked at the age among NSC students, we probably find quite a bit larger spread. I've looked around and I see a lot of different age groups in on campus. So this would be an example where you have a high spread in scores, lots of differences in scores, and if you calculated measures of variability, they would be relatively larger than if you calculated them here. So you can see that as variability increases, the width of the shape of the distribution also increases to represent that increase in spread of scores. So variability is very predictive of how accurate the mean is going to be in terms of how well the sample will represent the population and just in terms of fun examples like this. So let's say that you go out to dinner with someone and you agree before you order anything that you're going to split the bill. Well, after it's all said and done, you have a $30 bill and you each pay 
Well, that $15 could be accurate or inaccurate depending on what each bill cost. So let's see. If you have a low variability situation, meaning that the bills are very close in price, you ordered $16 worth of food. Whoever you went out with ordered $14 worth of food. Although you're getting a slightly better deal because you're paying a dollar less than what you actually ordered, the mean is pretty accurate there. This is a fair split. But if you have a scenario that's high variability, meaning a very wide difference between your bill and your friend's bill, well, in this case, the mean is very inaccurate and you are getting a great deal. You're only paying $15 for $22 worth of food and your friend is kind of getting the short end of the stick there because the mean isn't accurate. It's not a fair split. So the most simplistic measure of variability is the range. And like I mentioned earlier, there are two different formulas depending on what kind of variable is being measured. If you have continuous data, remember, that's data that can just be any interval of numbers. It can be a fraction or a decimal, not restricted to whole numbers. So to calculate the range for continuous data, you take the upper real limit of the highest value in your data set minus the lower real limit of the lowest value in your data set. And remember, the upper real limit is halfway above the value, and the lower real limit is halfway below. Then for discrete data, the range is calculated somewhat differently. So in that one, you take the highest score minus the lowest score, then you add one to that answer. Now, the reason that you don't use upper and lower real limits for discrete data is because there really isn't any upper or lower real limits for discrete data. Each number is a whole number, so there's no need to take into account the upper and lower real limits. There's no measure in between each number that's on the response scale. So, for example, let's say that you had some data that ranged from 3 to 12. Well, your highest score would be a 12, and your lowest score would be a 3. And if it was continuous data, you would take 12.5 minus 2.5. So if your highest score is 12, the upper real limit for that score is 12.5. If your lowest score is a 3, the lower real limit for that score is a 2.5. And 12.5 minus 2.5 is 10. If that data was discrete, then you would just take 12 minus 3 plus 1, and 12 minus 3 is 9, plus 1 is 10. So you get the same answer, you just use different formulas. Now I will point out that the book states that you can also just use the range as the highest minus the lowest. I just want to point out that for our purposes, we're going to use the two formulas that you see on the screen. Using just the highest minus the lowest is really only appropriate when you're looking at proportions, and we're not going to be looking at proportions in this class, but I wanted you to know about it. And the reason that I prefer the highest minus lowest plus one for discrete data is it because it tells you the number of different categories if you have a nominal data or the number of different responses, not just what's in between. Now the range is easy to measure, but it's not very informative or an accurate representation of data. The range is heavily influenced by outliers or extreme scores and it does not consider all the scores in the distribution. It only takes into account the highest and the lowest score. Okay, moving on to the standard deviation, which again is going to be the most commonly used measure of variability in this class and in most research in general. So, the standard deviation is really important because it gives you information on how any given score compares to all of the other scores in the data set based on the mean. So it tells you the distance of a specific score from the mean of all scores in terms of the typical spread of scores. And this is important information to know. And here's an example of how that works. So let's say that you find out that you got a 90% on quiz one and you're really excited. You're like, oh my gosh, I got an A. That's cool, but maybe you are very concerned about social comparisons. And, I mean, I remember doing this all the time. You say, okay, well, I got a 90, but what was the class average? And then you find out that the class average was an 80%, and you are feeling really good about yourself. You did better than the average. So not only did you get an A, but you did better than the average. That's a really good thing. 
well, you also need to consider the standard deviation. So if there was a relatively small standard deviation, let's say that there was a standard deviation of 10 points, well, then if you're looking at this, you would say, oh, this is about what the distribution would look like. And this 90% grade falls in a really low frequency part of the distribution. So if you look at this, remember, higher the point in the graph, the more frequent that grade occurred in this case. Here, your 90 falls here. That's at a really, really, really low frequency part of the distribution. There's not very many people in the class who did as well or better than you. So you're feeling awesome about yourself and your performance on that quiz. Well, let's say that we had a standard deviation that was larger. Let's say 20 points. Well, the mean is still 80%, but now there's, there's more spread in scores. So the scores aren't concentrated all around that 80. They're spread out across the distribution. So in this case, your 90 is still in a very high frequency part of the distribution. You're not really feeling quite as awesome as you were before when you were an extreme outlier in the high end here. Here, that same score of 90 with the mean of 80, it's still pretty high. You're still doing great. But there's a whole lot of other people that did just as well as you did. So it's important not just to consider where your score or a score is relative to the mean, but also how extreme it is in terms of the standard deviation or the typical spread in scores from the mean. So here are some formulas for calculating the standard deviation. The first one is for the population. And that little curly Q thing is called sigma. And it just stands for the population standard deviation, this right here. And the formula is the square root of the sum of squares divided by the size of the population, or how many scores are in the population. And we'll talk about the sum of squares here in a little bit. The formula for that's down here. The second formula is for the sample standard deviation. And that formula, S is the abbreviation for the sample standard deviation. It's pretty much the same as the population standard deviation formula, but the denominator has a lowercase n, and we're subtracting 1 from that n. Now, the reason that that is taking place, and I've mentioned this before, the sample is an estimate of the population. And for the most part, samples tend to underestimate the true spread and scores in the population. Because remember, outliers are going to increase the spread and scores and your measures of central tendency. And outliers are rarely included in samples. The very nature of an outlier means that they're rare and extreme, so they're probably not going to be included in your sample. So to correct for the fact that the sample often underestimates the variability of a population, you subtract by 1 in the denominator of the standard deviation for the sample. And when you divide, when you have a fraction, and you divide by a smaller number, the overall value increases. So essentially, we're bumping up the sampled standard deviation a bit to account for the fact that we know that this is going to underestimate the population standard deviation. And there's theoretical statistics behind why we do n minus 1 and not n minus 2 or n minus 3 that prove that this is the way to go, but I'm not going to get into that. That's beyond the scope of this class. The next formula that you need is the sum of squares. So this is what you need to calculate before you can begin to compute the standard deviation. The sum of squares has two different formulas. This first one is the one that we are going to be using in practice. It lends itself to fewer errors. But the second one is called the conceptual formula. And the conceptual formula does what it says. It shows you the concept behind the sum of squares. And the sum of squares stands for the sum of squared deviations. And I'll use the conceptual formula to explain that. So what this formula basically says is that you calculate the mean for the entire data set, or the population. Then you take x and subtract the mean for the sample or the mean for the population, depending on what you're working with. So each score minus the mean of all scores. 
Now, the reason that you have to square those deviations is because if you just took each x minus each mean and you added those together, you would get zero every single time. So you would take each x minus each mean and square it. Each x minus each mean and square it and then add those together. And that gives you the, sum, the same thing that you would get here for the sum of squares. And that's why when we're talking about the standard deviation, we take the square root to account for the fact that we had to square those differences, we're converting it back into the original metric that was used to measure the variable. So if you think about the sum of squares in these formulas, we're essentially saying what is the average deviation among all the scores in the data set. So this measures the square deviations. You're dividing it by how many scores you have, so you're turning it into an average, and then you take the square root to account for the fact or reverse the fact that those deviations were squared in the first place. So if you think about the calculations and what the standard deviation tells you, it just tells you the standard or the average distance or spread of scores in your data set relative to the mean here. So let's move on to the variance. And as I mentioned before, the variance is closely related to the standard deviation. But the variance just tells you how an individual score compares to the other scores in that population or the sample relative to the mean in terms of the squared distance from the mean. Whereas the standard deviation tells you the spread in scores in terms of the actual distance from the mean, the variance is in terms of squared distance from the mean. The same formulas are used for variance as a standard deviation. The only difference is you don't have that square root. So you're not reversing the fact that the sum of squares measures the square differences, and that's why it's the square distance from the mean that's measured by the variance. We prefer the standard deviation for the most part because we, again, reverse for the fact that we squared those differences in the sum of squares. So we're putting it back into the original scale that was used to measure whatever variable we're measuring, so it's easier to, to interpret. But I go over the variance because there's a couple of hypothesis tests that we'll get to where using the variance makes the overall calculations more straightforward and easier. So to calculate the variance, like I mentioned before, same exact formulas for the variance, except now the symbol, remember the population standard deviation was just sigma, well now it's sigma squared because the variance is just squaring the standard deviation, or in other words, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And like we learned about in the last lecture, if you do one thing to one side of an equation and you do the same thing to the other, the overall value remains the same. So if we square this side and square this side, then we're still working with the same overall value. We've just changed it a little bit. So if we have the square root here, but we square it, and then we square this, this is basically just saying, what's the standard deviation squared? Well, it's sum of squares divided by n. We're just getting rid of that square root. Hope that wasn't confusing. Okay. So same formulas, just no more square root, and add a square to the symbol for the standard deviation to get the variance. Sum of squares formula, exactly the same. That doesn't change at all. The only difference between the variance and the, st the standard deviation is in the final calculation of the variance, there's no square root. So here is an example using a frequency distribution table with some data in it. And you start off with this right here. And in practice, like in a quiz situation, this is all you'd be given. You need to understand how to get the values you need by creating new columns and doing calculations. So if we're looking at the number of semesters among a population of 51 students, well, the range for that variable would be calculated with upper and lower row limits because it is a continuous variable number of semesters. You could be at, for instance, NSC for 1.5 semesters or 1.2 or 10.3. You can have fractions in between. So the formula you would want to use would be the upper real limit for the highest score minus the lower real limit for the lowest score. Highest score is 10, lowest score is 1. Halfway above 10 is 10.5. Halfway below 1 is 
10.5 minus 0.5 is 10 for the range. The mean, this should be a familiar calculation for you by now. You just add up all the scores and divide by how many scores are in the data set. There's, so remember, we've done this before. To find out what the sum of x is, the sum of all the scores, you have to take the frequencies into account. So there's 110, 3 sevens, 1 6, 4 fives, 1 4, 10 threes, 4 twos, and 27 ones in our data set. You multiply across, then you add by going down. If we add all those scores together, we get 126. And to find the population size, just add F. All these numbers added together gives you the population size of 51. We have 51 scores in this data set. So the mean is 126 divided by 51, 2.471. And you should recognize this from the Chapter 3 lecture. Now the standard deviation. So the first step in calculating the standard deviation is finding that sum of squares. And you've also gotten practice finding this first value in the sum of squares formula, where you square each x value and then add those together. But remember, if your data is presented in a frequency distribution table, you still have to take those frequencies into account, just like you did here when you were calculating the sum of x. So here, each x squared, 10 times 10, 9 times 9, 8 times 8. And then you multiply each one of those squared values by its respective frequency. So 100 times 1, 81 times 0, 64 times 0, 49 times 3, and so on and so forth. Then you add those together and you get the sum of x squared for this value here. Now, remember order of operations. There's a difference between the sum of x squared and the sum of x quantity squared. So this next value that you need to find, you add up all the x values and then square that entire value. So we found that for the mean already, 126 is the sum of x. That's what you'll be squaring for that second sum of x quantity squared. Then for n, you just put in how many scores you have, or the population size in this example. I like to do my calculations one step at a time, and I recommend that when you show me your work on your quiz, you do the same thing to prevent errors and to earn that partial credit, just in case you make a simple math error. So first thing I'm going to solve for is that exponent, according to order of operations. So this becomes 50, 532 minus 126 squared, is 15,876 divided by 51. I just did one step there. Everything's the same, but I squared 126. Then the next step, division, I'm going to take this and divide it by 51, and I end up with 532 minus 311.2941. Remember, as you go through calculations, round to the 10,000th place, four decimals to the right, and then for the final answer, round to the 1,000th place, or three decimals to the right. So 532 minus 311.2941 is 220.706. So that's the squared deviations of all of the scores from the mean of the scores. But we aren't done. We just want to get the sum of squares so that we can find the average distance of all scores by dividing this by the total number of scores and then taking the square root. So that's all about the standard deviation. So here's the formula that we looked at already. Square root of sum of squares divided by the population size. Plug in the sum of squares you just found, the population size. Do that division, so 220.706 divided by 51. Carry that square root, don't forget it, that's the last step is solving for the square root. So 220.706 divided by 51 is 4.3276. Take the square root of that, the standard deviation is 2.08. So on average, students have been within 2.08, have been at NSC within 2.08 semesters of this mean of 2.471. Now, you can look at this and see that eh, that's somewhat accurate representation of the data, but not really, because for the most part, most people have been here for one semester. So just like the mean is more accurate when you have a normal distribution, the measures of variability and the standard deviation is far more accurate when you have a normal distribution. Variance for this you could calculate this without the square root, or you can just look and see what the standard deviation was 
before you took the square root. So 4.328. I just rounded this to the thousands place, and that is your variance. So here's an example of variability with a sample instead of a population. And I just want to note that just because data is presented as raw data doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sample. And just because data is presented in a frequency distribution table does not mean it's a population. You have to look for the word sample or population in the problem set to decide which type of data it is. So here's an example of variability with a sample. So just hypothetically, let's say I asked seven NSC students how many children they had, and this is the resulting data. Um, I want to point out that this is normally distributed, so the standard deviation and the mean will be representative of the data. Also, I want to point out that this is a discrete variable, the number of children. You can't have a fraction of children. It's a whole number only, so it's a discrete variable. So when you calculate the range, you're going to use the formula for discrete variables, the highest minus the lowest plus 1. The highest score is a 3. The lowest score is a 1. 3 minus 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3. And remember before, I said I prefer this measure, even with discrete variables, because it tells us how many different categories we have in our data set. Well, some people have 1, some people have 2, and some people have 3 children, 3 different categories in our data set. And that's represented here by this 3 for the range. Now to calculate the sample mean, you take the sum of x divided by the sample size, just adding these together, I put n is 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 scores. Sum of x, all these added together is 14. 14 divided by 7 is 2. Next is the standard deviation. So we need to start off with the sum of squares. Same formula that we used here for the population. The only difference is that we have a lowercase n here instead of an uppercase n or a capital N. Okay. So the sum of x squared. When you don't have data that's presented in a table, it's really easy just to rewrite the raw data in squared form and add those together to get the sum of x squared. So 1 plus 1, 1 times 1 is 1. The squared version of 2 is 4, so 4 plus 4 plus 4. And then we have two 3's in our original data set. The squared version of that is 9. So two nines in these squared x's. So 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 9 plus 9 gives us 32. And that's that first value in your sum of squares formula. So there's 32. We already know what the sum of x is that we need to square the whole value of. Remember the sum of x quantity squared, what's in the parentheses comes first. So we have 32, sum of x squared, each x value squared and add together, minus 14 squared, all the x values added together, and then squaring that entire value, divided by the number of scores in the sample of 7. So first step, solving for the exponent, 14 times 14 is 196. Everything else is the same. Next step, solving for the division, 196 divided by 7 is 28. And then we're going to subtract that from 32 to get 4 for the sum of squares. Then the next step, the standard deviation. Here's the formula that you've already seen. Remember, we're subtracting 1 from the denominator so that we can bump up the overall value a little bit to account for the fact that we know that the sample standard deviation that we're using to try to estimate the population standard deviation, the sample standard deviation is going to underrepresent that just by the very nature of the fact that it's hard to capture all those extreme scores from the population in your sample. So the spread will be smaller in the sample. That is an important concept to know. So here's the formula. Just plug in what we found for the sum of squares here. n was 7, 7 minus 1 in the denominator. Keep carrying that square root until the very end. So let's solve for the denominator. So we have 4 and then 7 minus 1, so divided by 6. 4 divided by 6 is 0.6667. Again, rounding to the 10 thousandths place during calculations. Then solve for the square root, and you get 0.817, solving to the thousandths place for the final answer. And the variance is just the standard deviation value that you got before you took the square root. So the variance is just what's in there, and I just rounded it to the thousandths place. So, for example,
let's say that you had a standard deviation of 9. Well, without any calculations, you should know that with a standard deviation of 9, the variance would be 81. 9 times 9 is 81. Well, what if your variance was 9? Well, if your variance was 9, then you know your standard deviation is 3 without any calculations. Because, again, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, and the variance is the squared standard deviation. Now, finally, I want to talk about the empirical rule. And this is going to become more and more important as the semester progresses. And at some point, you're going to be looking up proportions and probabilities that correspond to these percentages in a table to figure out how extreme specific scores are in a distribution. And just kind of a looking ahead to inferential statistics, let's say that you take a sample of people and you manipulate the independent variable and you compare their mean on the dependent variable to the mean of the population. Well, if you are comparing the mean for the sample to this population distribution, you would hope that you would have an extreme mean. In other words, for the sample, you would have a mean that's several standard deviations above or below the population mean. And that would tell you that you have an extreme sample whose differences on the dependent variable may likely be due to what you manipulated. In other words, they no longer represent the population. They're extreme because whatever you did worked. Whatever condition you manipulated had an impact on whatever you thought it would. Okay, back to the empirical rule for our purposes now for variability. So there are predictable proportions or probabilities in the normal distribution based on the mean and the standard deviation. So 68% of scores in a normal distribution, which is all we're going to be working with for the rest of the semester, 68% of scores fall within one standard deviation of, of the mean, one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. 68% of scores fall within that one standard deviation above or below the mean. 95% of scores in a normal distribution fall within two standard deviations of the mean, above and below. So all this would represent 95% of scores. 16% of scores are above one standard deviation from the mean, and 16% of scores are below one standard deviation from the mean. And then on the very extreme end, 2.5% of scores are above two standard deviations from the mean, and 2.5% of scores are below two standard deviations from the mean. So if you have a normal distribution and all you know is that the mean is 20 and the standard deviation is 5, well, you know that 68% of scores are within 5 points, one standard deviation, of the mean of 20. So 68% of scores are within 20 plus or minus plus or minus 5 points. Well, 20 minus 5 is 15, 20 plus 5 is 25, so within one standard deviation of the mean would be between 15 and 25, and 68% of the scores in that distribution would be between 15 and 25. Now, if we're looking at 16% of scores above 25, here, remember, 16% of scores are above one standard deviation from the mean, one standard deviation above the mean, 20 plus 5, 25 and 16% of scores are below one standard deviation below the mean. So, one standard deviation, 5, 20 minus 5 is 15, 16% of scores are below 15. Now let's go to this very extreme end of the distribution. So we know that 2.5% of the scores are at least two standard deviations above the mean. Well, two standard deviations, 5 plus 5, or 5 times 2 is 10. So if we have a score that's two standard deviations above the mean, that would be 20 plus 10, 30, 2.5% of scores are above 30, or above two fives from 20, two standard deviations above the mean. Now to the other extreme, 2.5% of scores are 
below negative one standard deviation from the mean. And if we subtract, or sorry, below two standard deviations from the mean. So if we subtract two standard deviations from the mean of 10 or 20, again, two standard deviations is 10, 20 minus two standard deviations, 20 minus 10 is 10. 2.5 percent of scores are below 10. You're going to get lots of practice with this, so don't worry if you're a little bit confused. So now I want you to try this on your own. So let's say that we have a distribution with a mean of 20 and a standard deviation of 2. So I want you to figure out 68 percent of scores are between what two values and then 16% of scores are above what value, 16% of scores are below what value, 2.5% of scores are above what value, and 2.5% of scores are below what value. So pause this video and take some time and try to figure these out for yourself to give yourself some practice. Okay. Hopefully you paused the video and tried to figure these out, but now I'll give you the answers. So if you do the calculations, 68% of scores are within two points of the mean or within one standard deviation of the mean, which is two points. So 20 minus 2 is 18, 20 plus 2 is 22. 16% of scores are, remember, above one standard deviation from the mean. One standard deviation is 2. 20 plus 2 is 22. 16 percent of scores are below one standard deviation below the mean. So if we take one standard deviation and subtract it from the mean, 20 minus 2 is 18. And there we go. Then remember 2.5 percent of scores are above one standard deviation or two standard deviations from the mean. So two standard deviations, 2, 4 plus the mean, 24. And then 2.5% of scores are below two standard deviations below the mean. Two standard deviations, still four, but now we're subtracting that from 20. 20 minus four is 16. 2.5% of scores are below 16. So that is all that I expect you to know from chapter four, variability. And this will give you the information that you need to be successful on your knowledge check, in your practice problems in class, and then on the quiz.